all kindreds, all tribes, all tongues, male and female, even the religious gap. He knocked that out. Rich and poor, everything that divides. He brought unity of the Spirit. And then he talked about the promise. When he ascended, he said, Now when I leave, you all go to Jerusalem and you tarry there until the promise comes. Somebody say, Ooh. And they did. And he did. He came. As a matter of fact, if you don't know what the promise is, for those of you who have Esau, anybody ever use Esau? You see, I was a preacher before there was an Esau. And what we had to do is spend days to do a 15 minute sermon. Of course, once you get it established, the word gets in you and it like changes. But after I had been through the scripture and tearing up many different translations and reading all kinds of materials and handfuls of purpose, which is a concordance, and uh, the Strong's concordance and the Young's concordance. If you want to be strong, use the Strong's. If you want to be young, use the Young's. I choose both. Uh, so you use all these helps and these tools to learn. Now they got this thing called eSword online. You can go and pull up your translation. If they don't have your translation available, you can buy your translation. And just punch in your word. And every word from Genesis to Revelation will just pop up. So, if you have any sort, don't punch in the promise. See what happens. Punch in giving, tithing. One of those words. See how many times that's in the Bible. You'll be amazed. You know when something's repetitive over and over, God is repeating it for a reason. It's not that he's old and gray and dull and being redundant for no good cause like I am sometimes. But he does it for our own good. And I have learned that through the years that I need to hear something about 20-something times before it sinks in. So if I say to you, what was your name again? Don't be offended. <laughs> and if I've known you for years and I look at you and I go, I do that to my kids. You just ask them. <laughs> anyway, back to this e sword thing. I thought, man, I punch in stuff and it just pulls up. So I decided to punch in my name on my favorite translation. Nothing came up. So I punched in, preacher. Ah, there it is. <laughs> so I had a great thought. I went to Google and I punched in Lonnie Nix, preacher. I was amazed. I'm all over that thing. <laughs> so Google is good for something. Is there hair hanging off of that or is it me? Oh, that must be my time before you worry about it. No, I'll use this raggedy old thing. So it's over. <laughs> I like it soft. So anyway, getting back to uh, what we're talking about here. The promise is this incredible thing that was fulfilled on Pentecost. And it's multifaceted because it's just not singular, but it was the outpouring of the Spirit. Because God promised that He would come and not just be with His people. He was with His people under the Old Covenant. They would set up the tabernacle and they would put in the inner veil and they would place the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies and the presence of God would show up there and He would be amongst His people. But you see, under the promise... He said, I'm not just going to be with my people. I'm going to live in them. And I'm going to empower them. I'm going to imbibe them with life. I'm going to make them overcomers. I'm going to give them all the benefits of heaven if they're willing. I'm going to make them sharper and smarter 
and, and even smell better. You think I'm making that up, don't you? You see, if you spend enough time with God, your taste gets sweeter because He's the Word and He's the honey in the rock. And when you hang out with the rock, that honey is going to get on you because it's tangible. You see, the anointing is tangible and it gets on stuff. It just rubs off on things. As a matter of fact, the anointing means to be rubbed or smeared on. And when Jesus came, he had something rubbed all over him. He was anointed with the power and the love and the spirit of God. And he said, I'm going to give it to you. What part of that one missing? Hmm. We live like we're still struggling and trying to get there someday. As a matter of fact, I even hear, I'm not even calling believers, I'm going to just call them Christians. Some of them still have the thought that, oh, someday, when we die and pass to the other side, we will have a victorious life. Say, what? So you're only in training for the kingdom of God when you die? Listen, if Jesus is in you, the kingdom of heaven is present now. And if you read the scripture with enlightenment by the Spirit of God, and you've got fire in your veins of the Spirit of God, you will begin to understand that all the benefits is for the here and now, not someday when you pass to the other side. You see, when you pass to the other side, you don't have to worry about sickness and pain and illness and poverty and stupidity and all of that stuff. The Spirit of God is for the here and now and all the benefits that He brings of heaven with Him. To live an overcomer's life now, not someday. It's a given if you're walking on streets of gold. If, if this doesn't make you excited or happy, most every promise in the book is for this physical life here and now. And then when you pass over eternal life. That's just the way it says it. Somehow we get so dull in our hearing and in our seeing and in our thinking because we live in the natural instead of living in the spiritual which God has designed for it to be under the new covenant. Not under a law of a bunch of physical rules and regulations but we have been set free to live in the spirit. Where you're not trying to hold to a bunch of commandments and worry about everything you do, but it comes natural to you because the Spirit of God in you cannot break the commandments, nor can it sin, nor can it miss God. Somebody say, now, that preacher makes a lot of sense. I know. Someday a big offering is going to come in just for you. <laughs> then I double that in Jesus' name. <laughs> Don't let you go get holy on me. You see, we have been put in boxes and confined to rules and regulations that really has no truth in them. Christianity in the mainstream has picked up little sayings and slogans that is not even true. And what it does is it cripples us when we buy into it and believe it and we don't even realize what we're buying into. And just because it sounds good, we agree with it not realizing that we have... I don't want to use that because that's kind of to the masculine of a man losing his manhood, so let me, let me find something else. What it, it cripples us, it, it, it renders us powerless, and yet we go along with it because it somehow has a sense of humility to it, but it's false. Okay? It somehow seems good, but it's not what God has designed for His people for the better or the best. Because good is always the enemy of best. And God has designed for us to live in the kingdom and live for Him the best we can. Not for what we can struggle and strive and work to, to keep a bunch of rules and regulations. Are you following me? 
Don't miss what I'm saying. We do not go around purposely breaking any laws, rules, or regulations. But in Christ, we fulfill every one of them. And beside that, the rules and regulations was, was, was brought forth to expose sin and unrighteousness in the first place. The Apostle Paul said it worked as a tutor to show us that we were in need of a Savior and bring us to Christ Jesus. And once we have gotten there at the cross, and we pass through that cross, we leave the old nature and the old world and the old covenant on the other side as we pass through. And then when we rise in Him, we rise in newness of life. Like the Apostle Paul said to the Galatians in 2.20, he said, It is no longer I that live, but Christ that live in me. And the life that I now live, I, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave his life for me. You see, it's only in the kingdom of God where everything works in the reverse. You've got to die to live. You got to give to get. You got to serve to be great. I love the upside down kingdom. <laughs> Are you still with me? Okay. So, the first thing I want, and listen, don't, I, I never ever say things or preach things just to be controversial or be different or to argue or disagree with somebody else. Ever. That's not my intention. My intention is to bring the people that hear my voice into truth and to liberate them and bring them into the full freedom that God has designed for their lives. Okay? Not to argue or disagree with somebody else. Okay? But the whole saying about we are Judeo-Christian doesn't hold water. Because Judeo means Judaism, which is the religion that was birthed out of the law of Moses. Are you all following me? We are new covenant believers. I want that to resonate. Listen, I know why people say we are Judeo-Christian. Because of the attachment to all of the, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the Old Testament. And I get that, and I'm not arguing with that, and that's all fine and dandy. But through that, we bring the law, and we bring that, those attachments that come with them, which brings us back under that, that uh, oppression. Remember, it's the law of sin and death. Jesus nailed that to a tree, didn't he? He said that he knew that we, it was contrary to us and we couldn't fulfill it anyway. So Jesus just went ahead and said, let's just handle it for him, Father, I'm in. And so in him, he took on the whole thing, including the law that was written against the sinner. Remember, there was never a law written for the lost. But we're all deemed Sinners, when it comes to Christ and the promise. Otherwise, there would be those that would be excluded. Do you want me to prove this with biblical verses? I would love to. Somebody said you wanted meat and potatoes tonight? I'm about ready to give them to you. First off, let's start with Matthew 9.17. It is in the red, baby. Does anybody know what in the red means? That's red meat. So if you're going to eat meat tonight, it's going to be red meat. Let's start with red meat. Nor, and this is the words of Jesus, nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, and the wine is spilt, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. It is an injustice to mix Judaism with Christianity. It just don't go, it just don't flow, and we destroy both because it is a bunch of Christians trying to, to be living by Judaism regulations and it's just not going to work. And Jesus said, don't do it. Do you know how many times he, he used that scripture in the New Testament? Get in the red meat and find out how many times he said it. It'll blow your mind. And he wasn't talking about wine. He was talking about the Spirit of God and the new thing that God was doing on the planet versus what the old religion was in an old world that passed when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and the kingdom of heaven came forth on planet earth. Yeah. 
if our live stream is down for a week or two, then we're going to get these things recorded. So if you need to view this a hundred times, it'll be there for you. And I don't even know how far I'm going to get. I'm giving my best. Let's go to Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham, somebody say, love Abraham. And his seed was the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. That's mind-boggling right there. 317. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, do I need to explain that? Because we're talking about the promise given to Abraham. The law came through Moses 430 years later. Okay? Which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ that it would make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer promised. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Can I throw something in here just so it'll clarify everything that's going on in the world today? You know that all the terrorists, religious terrorists, bombings and the war and the fighting and the bickering and the hatred and the animosity and the religious fervor that's going on all tied back to this right here because it's between the Hebrews and the Arabs fighting over who is the rightful heir of Abraham. So now, listen up. Because nobody has been excluded. Not even one. Because if they were excluded, we would probably be excluded. Because we were afar off. But he called us by name. He even told the sons of Abraham by blood. He goes, you know what? Foreigners is going to come in and take your seat at the table and you'll be cast out. Say, what? No, Jesus said that. Because it's by promise and you just don't have it coming just because it's in your blood. Hmm. Now, if you're Jewish, if you're Hebrew or Arab and you're in here tonight, don't get mad. Let me finish. There's hope for all of us. It's just that God doesn't play favoritism and there's none special above another. Because what I'm telling you tonight is the greatest equalizer that ever came to planet Earth. And we're still being Somebody needs to kick this government in the butt. Divisive. Hateful. They need a dose of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about any certain, I'm talking about the whole bunch. Somebody put online, you know, I, 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 it was a little comical, I forget who the cartoon figure was. I wish that when somebody lied, their pants really did catch on fire. And I said, man, all of Washington, D.C. would go up in flames. <laughs> well, we elected them and put them there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, back to the anointing. For the inheritance of the law is... It is no longer promised, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Galatians 23.22 But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to all who believe. That right there is good news. But that elevates Jesus so far above the heavens and so far above everything that everybody wants to believe about Jesus Christ. It's mind-boggling. That's why some people hate the name of Jesus. But he made it all equal. He is your best friend if you can just open up your mind. He is your redeemer. He is your healer. He is your savior. He is the one who loves your soul. That's why I say I'm a man in love with another man. You just don't even know how deep his love goes. How can we reject such a great love when he's done for us? 
4, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And don't let that sons mess you up. See, I'm here. I'm still on the woman thing. Because I want to get this equal and I want to get the religious thoughts and the mindsets. Many of which have been handed down through Judaism to us and we have bought into it. Even the writers of the New Testament were still struggling with it. And that's why they said some of the things they did. And they would say one thing and turn around and say something else. And you, you got to remember too, slavery was still accepted at that time. That's why the best that Paul could say was, hey, be kind to your you know, your servants. Treat them well. Today we say that's unacceptable. You don't have slaves in my house. If there's any slaves at all, it's because we were free men and we were made slaves and slaves into Christ Jesus. The way Paul said it. He said that if you were a slave, then you become Christ's free man. Somebody say hallelujah. I love the liberty of God. You know, he came to set us free. It's a message of liberty and freedom like the world has never heard before. We just need to wake up to the truth and begin to love one another. Begin to move in course with one another, not trying to see eye to eye and come in total agreement. If you do that, we will never have unity, but we, begin, we need to begin to stand shoulder to shoulder and look at the one who has brought unity to us, and we can agree on who that is. Alright, I'm going to get halfway through it, but I'll keep moving. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, when this really hit home with me, I began to understand the armor of God. Because when we were baptized into Him, we got the full armor on. The helmet of salvation. Where's your salvation from? Jesus Christ. Who's your breastplate of righteousness? Jesus Christ. Who is the sword of the word? Jesus Christ. Who is the shield of faith? Jesus Christ. Who is the preparation of the gospel? Jesus Christ. Who is truth? Jesus Christ. And you never take it off. If you're baptized into something, you don't take it off when you go to bed at night and sleep with your armor on, folks. And pray with your eyes open, too. And when you drink, don't put your face down in there like a dog. Pull that water up and keep your eyes open. Especially when you're down in the dark alleys. You know, it's amazing what I've seen in prayer circles. Because I keep my eyes open. Anyway, I'm not going to go there. Okay, here comes, here comes part of the equalizer right here. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, and you can throw every other tribe in there. There is neither slave nor free. Oh, that's a good one right there. There is neither male nor female. And we can also throw in rich or poor. You can just keep going down the list and add them all in there because they all fit in other places in the scripture. It, is, it, it includes them. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I just... You know, what part of one don't we understand? What part of one don't we get? Because in Him, no matter what our gift and our talent and our calling is, we are equal in Him. Doesn't mean we have the same talents. Doesn't mean we know the same things. Doesn't mean we can all do the same stuff. But in Him, we are equal. Because we are one with the head. God's amazing. How do we goof up such a perfect thing or refuse it altogether? Galatians 3.29 But if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Amen? I'm going to try to move a little faster. I'm going to throw a lot of now I'm going to throw some meat and potatoes at you. Let's go to Romans 4.13. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see, if you go to Hebrews and start reading about this, it'll talk about that if the first covenant was perfect and the law that was given 
was adequate and could save to the uttermost, there would have been no other reason to bring a second. But in that it wasn't perfect, a better one had to come. And that was fulfilled through Christ Jesus. Uh, Romans 4.14, for those who are of the law are heirs. Faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. You see, because of the way God has done this, not even those who are under the law is excluded. Just because it was promised, but he includes us all. Somebody say, wow. Romans 4.17, I'm going to go ahead and include these. As it is written, I have been made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls things which do not exist as though they did. Don't you love faith? You see, the faith of heaven works just like the faith that God has given us here on the planet Earth. The thing is, when we move in it on planet Earth, it's much different because where there is great darkness, it takes great faith. That's why Jesus told his disciples, Hey, it's better to have not seen and believed than to see and believe. Out of the darkness comes some of the most amazing things. Out of the hardest struggles. And most people just want to rush through life just to get through the hard time and get to the other side, get to where it's better. And some people just are ready just to leave the planet thinking that that's the answer. That's not the answer. We're called to be in this earth suit and establish the kingdom of heaven here on earth just as long as we can because of the things that we do here is the things that's going to matter in the eternals. Do you know, otherwise, why would all the angels in heaven be wanting to come down to earth and check out what's going on here? And we're trying to rush to there when it's about here right now for us. Uh, go ahead and go. You know, chew on that a minute. And believe me, hardship is nothing to laugh at. Some of the, some of the greatest spirituals that ever came was through hardship of slavery and the things that was being uh, uh, done to the people in captivity. You know that swing low, sweet chariot? They were talking about getting off of this planet because they knew that in the heavenlies there was something better. But the thing is, when you endure and you fight the fight of faith, it is better that we go through. Paul struggled with that himself, being imprisoned in Rome, saying, do I go or do I stay? He said it's for your benefit, I'll stay. And he stayed until they chopped his head off. Where way to go? We all need to get our heads chopped off. And I don't mean that physically. In order for you to have the mind of Christ, you must lose this mind. Because in the case of two heads, when it comes to the things of Christ, in the mind of Christ, two heads are not better than one. Those that lay under the altar beheaded for the sake of Christ and crying out, Hell on, O Lord! Some of us have put that way off in some future somewhere because it was written in Revelation. Let me say to you, it's on the here and the now. We, mean, we need to begin to understand the Word of God is written for us and to us. And sometimes it's not even directly to us, but to the, it was written to the people of that time. But we still get the benefit of it because we can ask the Spirit for wisdom and understanding and not losing it somewhere and trying to push it off into the future that doesn't make any good sense and doesn't do us any good today. 
that oh, someday you'll make it there and dangle it in front of you like a carrot in front of a horse. That's not the way Christianity works. That's not the way the Spirit of God and the Kingdom of Heaven work. Everything that He has given to you, He has given to you in the here and now. We just need the wisdom and the understanding and the Spirit of God to go forth with tenacity and take hold of the things of God and live it today. Am I getting a little too passionate up here? All right. Where was I at? God who gives life to the dead. And he calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You know, the basic thing is when God does that, what happens? You see, number one, it's impossible for God to lie. So if he says something, it's coming forth. And that same God lives down on the inside of you. And the same faith by which God said, let there be light dwells in you. Because when he called into the void of your darkness and he said, light be, you were filled with the light of the living God who drove out the darkness, who drove out the demons, who drove out all the doubt, who drove out all that false thinking and everything that raises its head against Christ Jesus. Some of you think that the Antichrist is somebody that's going to be a great political leader or set in the White House. Bah! Antichrist means against Christ. It means against the anointing. You want me to get to that? I'll get to that. <clears throat> Call those things in which did not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope in hope believed. <laughs> I got to play that. I got to do this again. Who contrary to hope in hope. Believe. In other words, faith hasn't arrived yet. He's in hope. And even contrary to hope, he is standing in hope and saying, I'm going to believe the promise of God, even though it doesn't make any good sense. Because he's being real here. How many of you have been real with God? I know you don't lie, God, but I feel like you're lying to me right now. How many of you have been there? I thought so. And it's okay to be emotional. God is an emotional God. People who try to take emotion out of everything are straight flipped. And those people who think there's no emotion will come and listen to me preach either. They just don't know what they're missing. My God is an emotional God. He loves. He gets angry. He cares. He's passionate. He's awesome and wonderful. He has all the emotions. God has a bad day. How can you have a bad day in heaven? When you got three million disobedient children on the planet, you have a bad day too. Somebody need to hang out with him and ask him some questions. He'll talk to you. If I can't make God real to you, then I have no business up here on this platform. My God is real, and I know Him, and He knows me. Did y'all bring lunch? A midnight lunch? No, no, no. What if I don't get to see some of you again? Man, I'm going to preach like this is it. Who contrary to hope, in hope, believed so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. You see how it wrapped us all up and confined us together as the people of God. The offspring of the father of faith because he does he dared to believe God even when it didn't make no sense even when it was contrary to all hope he still hoped in the promise of God and he believed and became the father of many nations because of the anointed one that would come forth and bring it all together in the covenant so you need to get this down on the inside of your knower so that you know that you know that you know that this is the truth nobody can this kind of a story of the redemption of mankind in all the world, all the division, all the separation, all the walls that are torn down. But the thing is, we can't go tear people's walls down because if you do that, they're going to see you as the enemy. What we need is a tsunami of God that comes and overflows our walls. Everybody say hope. Oh. Faith. Faith. Yeah. Hope bringing forth faith. See, that's why 
why it says you don't have to hope no more once faith has arrived. Because hope brings the faith. When faith has arrived, you've received what you've been hoping for. That's why there's no, no, no doubt in true faith. You get what you got. You're losing my place. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead. Here he's called to be the father of many nations, and his body's already dead. The seed in him is dried up. This is impossible! But this is El Shaddai now, who's making the promise. The life giver, the breasted one. i got to take the time out here. I can't see. Help me, somebody pray. <laughs> Weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was already about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. You know, you remember when God was speaking his promise to Abraham, Sarah laughed. And then lied about her. How many of you done that? You get caught in lie. Compound. But then, if you read of her account later in the chapter of faith in Hebrews 11, God tells a different story about Sarah. Because it's the after forgiveness story. He rewrites your life, thanks to God. Some of you going through recovery right now. You're experiencing a rewriting of your life. In other words, you can change your past. Because actually tomorrow, this becomes your past. And your past begins to change. And your record begins to change. 